When reading Thomas Carlyle's History of the French Revolution in overlap with passages from Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall, one cannot but be struck by the clash of styles that occurs in the writing of these two men and their approaches to history. And it's interesting also that despite the great difference in their styles, it was Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire which appeared some 50 years before Carlyle's work, uh, it was this work of Gibbon that indeed inspired Carlyle's belief in the role that history could play as a spiritual exercise. And it also deeply undermined Carlyle's belief in Orthodox Christianity uh, as a dual factor in him awakening other modes in which spirit and energy can be harnessed. Carlyle was irritated by the manner of, uh, of, Gib of Gibbon's exuberant, sonorous, and epigrammatic style. And it was a trait Gibbon shared with, with other Enlightenment historians, um, whom Carlyle read and admired, the likes of David Hume and William Robertson. But he saw in it something lacking of energy. When Gibbon talks about the decline and fall of Rome, it occurs over not so much as centuries as over millennia. And Gibbon is forever above, looking above and beyond. Or, perhaps more aptly, is outside rather than within. Of course, it was outside the temple in Jupiter, or the steps of the Temple of Jupiter in Rome, when Gibbon is first seized with the idea of writing the history of the decline and fall, whereas Carlyle would probably be somewhere inside. He would be he would be in the thick of it or in the fabric of it. Certainly something with far more energy would be pulsing through his mind, whereas Gibbon is outside. And it's that mechanistic almost dissection that Gibbon is trying to come across that Carlyle wants to get rid of. He was very aware that in the 19th century, the mechanism or the mechanistic style of the Industrial Revolution was having a profound effect upon people's moral and spiritual understandings. And he was afraid, Carlyle was, of the mechanism becoming the deity. And so when he decided to write his own history on the French Revolution, he did not want that style to be repeated, but rather wanted to insert a great deal of energy into it. If we read history with any degree of thoughtfulness, Carlyle asserted, we shall find that the checks and balances of profit and loss have never been the grand agents with men. But they have never been roused into deep, thorough, all-pervading efforts by any computable prospect of profit and loss for any visible finite object but always for some invisible and infinite one. This is an interesting quote, which again shows what Carlyle is trying to get at. He's trying to write a history that can understand how the movement of the French Revolution happened. And he doesn't think that that can happen through analytics alone. The uprising is a mighty movement, to quote Carlyle. And its universal implications deserved it to be treated with a greater understanding of the human mind than what the Enlightenment could produce. So his opposition of the materialistic slant of the 19th century, its science and its program of juicing the physical universe into a series of systems and codes, did jar a bit with his, his background in mathematics at, the, at Edinburgh University. Um, so it's it's always interesting with Carlyle that while espousing terrific sense of spiritual understanding and and sort of metaphysical energy and will, that idea of the the unmoved mover, no one in Carlyle's era or epoch comes close to it, and indeed, even after him, uh, the likes of Matthew Arnold and Arthur Hugh Clough are 
really riding in his wake. They have interesting ideas, but you can always feel the Carlylean shadow behind them. Um, but it is interesting that Carlyle came from the mathematical background. And despite his force of nature, there there is that composure to him as well. That he has the understanding of the Enlightenment as well as having as well as having this je ne sais quoi, this greater being uh, which sometimes possesses him and overrules overrules him in that regard. He declared that history was at the root of all science, and indeed that's a phrase Gibbon would probably agree with. Yeah, who took it upon his life's work to write the decline and fall and was willing to do so from a position in which he would denigrate the uh, the Christian faith as one of the prime causes for the destruction of Rome, which he knew was not, a, uh, not something a simple careerist would make, but it is genuinely an act of someone trying to get to the root of a cause, whether or not that brings him into a comfortable truth or not. Gibbon was willing to go there, despite his difference in style of going there from Carlyle. Carlyle had also, by the 1830s, seen the growth in the likes of Walter Scott's novels and the, the popularity that it had given to the masses was something that he did, he did not enjoy. He thought it was historical fiction. It did not grasp that truth. And so, despite the matter of, of him not fully agreeing with Gibbon in style, he could agree with him far more than he could agree with Scott's approach. And it really did give him the impetus to write the revolution, the history of the French Revolution, even more. He understood history as narrative. And he understood the idea of the great man in history or the great decision makers in history and how they could be a part of that narrative. He eulogised Boswell's Life of Johnson and uh, called it an English odyssey that yields more real insight into the history of England during those days than 20 other books. This is again an insight into, her, into the Carlyle position of the great man he uses Samuel Johnson as an archetype of the great man as man of letters, which is how the 18th century produced great men, was through men of letters. And so it, it's, you can see there that Carlyle believed that the history books that did not go through this way and did not harness the energy of, of men and of movement, that, that it was worth reading a Boswell over these history books and that you would actually get a greater sense of history and would get closer to the truth of it than if you were reading these stale and dusty works which rattled on endlessly and did not enter your brain and did not really connect with you that narrative that history had to tell. Of course, once he decided to undertake this, uh, Carlyle He's almost the complete opposite of Gibbon. If one picks up the Penguin edition of Gibbon's Decline and Fall, the amount of sources he has collated, be it some obscure part of Macrobius, or even numerous of the Byzantine scholars, the Arabic scholars, it's all very well laid out, and you can see very clearly at each point which sources Gibbon is coming from. Whereas Carlyle is heterogeneous. He's, he's just, the orientation is all over the place. It's what Emerson called a stereoscopic method. And it's a rehearsal. He, he affected, in the rehearsal, he affected a balance between past and present. Simultaneously, looking at the biases of a source of authors and juxtaposing them with the debates, ranging, or raging, in uh, in his own time in the 1830s about the de July revolution 
which had of course sparked up the debate upon all things French Revolution again, just when some people had incorrectly believed it to be settled. So he designed the French Revolution to repudiate, uh, among others, Scott and Mill. Mill, who thinks that the historian must be well disciplined in the art of connecting facts into principles and applying the principles to the explanation of facts, in short, a philosopher. Judged philosophically, history is a calculus that disclosed the operation of permanent laws of human advancement. Carlyle, of course, is not interested in seeing any sort of regression model on history, but is rather interested in harnessing the elements that gave it energy and narrative. From Mill's vantage point, the violence and mayhem of the French Revolution, they're an unfortunate byproduct of change, a sort of process uh, as something mutates from A to B or evolves from A to B. Uh, the violence, the uproar of the revolution are scattering fringe elements, unfortunate, but in the grand scheme of things, not really that important. And and something which, once taken a, a proper laboratory style view of, are, are not of significance. But for Carlyle, it's the complete opposite. These are the untapped elements of the revolution. Um, the unexplainables uh, by scientific means are exactly what excites Carlyle, gives him energy. For Carlyle, Mill is the unhistorical one because he is so obsessed with the process that he does not understand that the process is only exists in Mill's own mind because Mill already has the narrative of history as being as being a sort of scientific mechanistic process and again if he wanted to stay true to the Gib gibbon endeavor of finding truth he was going to do so by abandoning the gibbon style so gibbon really is the father of mill in terms of utilitarian ideals or is one of the uh, fathers he is the historian of the enlightenment more than anyone else and that thought goes in through the 19th century to the liberal utilitarianism of mill but carlyle is actually far more the son of gibbon even though his style is entirely different what carlyle manages to do of course is to evoke the nowness of the conflagration to really be in the heart of it and to to place you in the movement and once you're in the movement of course any attempt to deem it all as a mechanistic process goes out the window and it's interesting also there is an element of carlyle here where he is always just trying to to feed uh, or to evoke outrage even by critics of his own times and you can see this when he when in the case of the San culottes he decides to take the Jacobin faction over the Girondin faction um honestly possibly just to to see where it takes him because it's the more interesting one also because there's more energy to the Jacobins um the radical point of vision was was almost twinned to the moral and spiritualness of it um, and he's trying to rupture that that British liberal opinion of the French Revolution, which said, "Oh, but if only, if only the Girondins had come through, then the lawyers, the intellectuals, and the clerks could have seen over a more steady uh, transition from the monarchy." But this is a, the egoism of the Girondins is suggest, suggestive to Carlyle of their own absence of vision. It's interesting in Gibbon, when he's talking of the decline and fall, that he sometimes does betray himself and enters into the mode of 
captivation with certain figures that stand out. One, of course, being Julian the Apostate, who, for Gibbon, as the last pagan Roman emperor, really does um, does embody the last chance for Rome to stick to its own ideals and to try and get back to its principles as a civilization and to not deteriorate spiritually with the inculcation of the foreign religion as Gibbon saw it. And I think it is part of those which, which likely inspired Carlyle to take out that element and then to enlarge that element in his thinking of the great men of history, in his essays on the great men. Now, of course, Carlyle's work was panned by Mill, who disagreed with the view of history as energy, as narrative, and hinted that Carlyle, uh, Carlyle's remoteness from the current intellectual currents of the time uh, was perhaps a reason why he was he, he he could not produce a history that they would accept. The sceptical, vol systematic thinking in Carlyle makes him, in Mill's mind, impossible as a historian. But it's interesting that others, such as Giuseppe Massini, who would take that idea of the energy of the French Revolution in his own will to try and unite the Italian state, that he saw the points of view are always elevated, and that uh, Carlyle's horizon is always extends uh, beyond the limits of his own country. Uh, Mazzini really does see in Carlyle's work the energy and the idea of how you galvanize masses and a, a decent depiction of the movements of masses, not as Burke would call them, a swinish multitude whose revolutionary ideology is a drunken delirium, but something with a human face, something that genuinely was striving for freedom, equality and brotherhood, however impractical. Historians, of course, broke with Carlyle for other reasons. They were going down the Gibbonian mould. In Germany, they had gone away from Goethe and towards his, the line of Leopold von Ranke. His notion of history was V, is eigentlich gewesen, how things really happened. And of course, we were heading into the, the world of Mommsen's history of Rome, which would be the German answer to Gibbon and which would be very much in the style of historian as Luf, as eagle flying over the carnage. So Carlyle's influence then, in terms of style, and in terms of understanding of the energy of the crowd, is seen not so much in the historians that come after him as the novelists. And you, he is coming just before the great age of the English novel. Dickens' Barnaby Rudge, and A Tale of Two Cities fall on his depictions of crowd scenes, as of course do Gaskell's Mary Barton and North and South. And the agitation of the crowd, as Carlyle depicted them, would always play on the minds of the English aristocracy and upper middle class, as strikes grew more for more fervent right up until the eve of the First World War in 1914. And you can see that in the Edwardian era and the likes of John Galsworthy's play Strife, which plays on the theme of the agitated crowd in a Carlylean sense. But the English historians, A.J.P. Taylor and O.G. Collingwood of the 20th century, whilst acknowledging that Carlyle did sense these masses, were more or less social historians I moved away from the biographical obsession of Carlyle. It's interesting to note in Gilbert Hyatt's work, The Classical Tradition, which was released in 1949, that he says, uh, in, in terms of ancient historians, that Ro the Roman historian Tacitus is still, in his own time, something quite 
vague uh, in terms of his style that he could not get to grips with it. Whereas Plutarch is full of energy and his depiction of the great men is full of understanding. But perhaps what was indeed happening was Hyatt was the last of the old guard and the historians, this aloofness, this detachment was the style of Tacitus and the style of the great men, that of Plutarch, was the one on the way out. And that just as Hyatt said, we had not reached the stage of our own civilization to properly understand Tacitus, that is exactly the stage of civilization that we were approaching. And that can be seen by, there was an interview that Lionel Barber, the, the then editor of the FT, was giving to uh, Steve Bannon, and he said that they were both admirers of history, uh, Barber more Tacitus, to Bannon's Plutarch. And I think that is an interesting modern, or if not modern, then contemporary juxtaposition of these two styles that we see in both Gibbon and Carlyle.